Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining for our inaugural uh, webcast webinar video where we invite a guest, we talk about markets, uh, we discover about the guest history. And today we are lucky to have JC Peretz from All Star Charts. He's the founder. And are you the CEO also? I'm the uh, maintenance guy. I'm the CFO. I am a <laughs> lead investor. <laughs> many wears many hats, just like you have to do when when you're running a business. Um, but uh, JC started All Star Charts, which we're going to get into what it is. Super excited to have you on the show. Thank you for joining us. Um, so, just as a quick background before we get into markets, uh, can you just tell us about kind of like start? How did you start getting into markets? How did you start getting into investing? Well, I just started trading and making all this money. And I'm like, man, this is easy. Like anybody could do this. So the rest is history, really. Yeah. How, 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 98, 99? <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> um, no, to be honest with you, you know, uh, markets were never even discussed at my dinner table. My parents were not. You know, they had their 401ks and my dad owned like mutual funds. But I grew up in the 80s when you were getting 15 percent in CDs. You know what I mean? So, you know, that was really more my parents. Uh, my father was an entrepreneur, so he was more invested in that sort of thing. Uh, my mother was in advertising um, or still is. So the market was really something I discovered when I moved to the Northeast. So I grew up in Miami, Florida. My family's from Cuba. So I, I, I went to college in Fairfield University in Connecticut played baseball. Can you imagine a Cuban from Miami playing baseball? No, never seen it. Never heard of it. Um, so, you know, this really was, I, I grew up, I mean, the truth is I grew up sheltered around a bunch of Cuban kids, you know, with, with backgrounds very similar to mine. I went to one bar mitzvah, you know, uh, I mean, I, I had some, uh, you know, I, I was never, uh, I was exposed to people of different colors because I was an athlete. So, you know, for, for us, uh, if you were fast and you could throw the ball hard, I don't care what color you are, purple, orange, black, white, doesn't matter to me. So for me, that was really the extent of, of, of what I saw around me. And then I moved to the Northeast. I didn't even know what a cannoli was until I was 18 years old and went to school in Fairfield. And I'm like, mom, dad, you guys have been holding out. So, you know, it was really cool. I, I was really surrounded by a lot of Italians. I went to a Catholic school, Fairfield University. So a lot of Italians, a lot of Irish. A lot of people from New York, Boston, New Jersey, so really opened up, uh, you know, my eyes a little bit more. And then once I got to the street, um, you know, then I was like, okay, this is how the world really works. Uh, and I got a PhD. I started interning for Merrill Lynch when I was in college. Uh, I fell in love with the market right away. I was reading IBD in the Wall Street Journal every single day. I didn't really know what I was reading, uh, but I was reading it, you know, <laughs> right? What was the first job out of college? Uh, I started working for Josh Brown. Uh, uh, Josh Brown was my first boss out of college. I was 22 years old, believe it or not. Uh, so him and I were good friends early on. Um, you know, he taught me a lot. Uh, we learned a lot of hard lessons together. Uh, we met a lot of really cool people together. I remember back in, man, it must have been like 2009, Stock Twits, or 2008 even maybe, Stock Twits was having some sort of, they, did, they were doing this thing called Stock Twits TV. And they had a launch party at Howard's Loft in Soho. And Josh and I didn't know Howard yet. Uh, so Josh was like, oh, there's a party in Soho, open bar. Let's go. I'm like, yeah, let's go. <laughs> so we went down there. And I, I'll never forget it. I mean, it was like plastic bottles of vodka. Uh, I mean, Howard's very, doing like videos. Classy, and classy. it was just kind of like, it was just cool. You know, and then from there, you know, we met Perlman. And, you know, this was over a decade ago. And this was, we were just really in the epicenter and the, the really the beginning at the genesis of what is the social media, financial Twitter, stock twits, fin twit, you know, whatever you want to refer to it as the beautiful community we have today. I just happened to have been in ground zero of that when there was just a handful of people, Perlman, Joe Weisenthal, you know, it was just, it was just a few people, uh, Zero Hedge, <laughs> Business Insider, you know, that was the world, you know, we'd get beers together afterwards. And like, that was a little community. And now it's this monster international beast that started with uh, a, a few nerds in New York. Got it. So you, you were one of the OGs on Twitter. I wouldn't classify me as an OG. I was there pretty early. Um, you know, if you talk to those around, you know, they were probably like 
OG OGs. I was probably maybe like that second round uh, of, uh, of, of participants. I was very early, obviously. Um, I wouldn't call me an OG per se, uh, but I was there and everybody influenced, all those people had blogs, right? So they influenced me to start my own blog. Uh, and I, that's where I started All Star Charts. You know, I got, you know, truth be told, uh, Rob, I got home after a, a, an evening out in New York City a weekday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, something like that. Got home late, you know, one of those nights, late dinner, and I get home, I'm hanging out in my apartment, you know, maybe watching Sports Center or something. And I'm like, I'll start charts. Hmm, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna buy that on GoDaddy, and maybe one day it'll come in handy. So this is like 07, 08. So I bought it, I had it, and then, you know, Pearlman and Howard and JB, they're like, JC, you know, you should start a blog. And I was like, okay, oh, let's do it. So uh, I already had the website, uh, Perlman like helped me set it up and everything like that. And that was a decade ago. And that little blog uh, was just a way for me to sort of, you know, put thoughts out there, share charts. And all of a sudden everybody starts calling me, you know, the TV stations and all that stuff and the show business people and in different institutions and hedge funds. So like all of a sudden I'm getting all this attention just because of this little blog. And now it's, you know, I don't know, one of the most widely read technical analysis research firms of all time. That's amazing. So before we get into all-star charts, how did you pick up technical analysis? Like, like how did you start thinking, wow, looking at a chart could actually help me with investing? Yeah, you know, <laughs> it's a funny story. Um, you know, I, 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 I hit up the fork in the road. I'm 22 years old, 23 years old. People around me are like twice my age, three times my age they swore up and down that they knew they had a handle on things in the market. And I, I guess I was just aware enough at the time to know these guys didn't know a damn thing. And they're twice my age or three times my age. And I'm like, it scared the hell out of me. I'm like, oh my God, if I end up like one of these people, like it was like, an, it, was just, it was a wake up call. So I was like, all right. I, I, at that point, like a master's degree was like, you know, was already coming out of favor. Uh, so I was like, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, CFA you know, learn about companies and fundamentals and stuff like that. Okay, that's a possibility. Or CMT, learn about stocks and trading them and stuff like that. I was like, oh, that sounds a lot better. So, I mean, little did I know how important that decision would ultimately be uh, and, and where that would take my life. I mean, it's taken that, just that decision alone has taken me all over the world. I mean, it's been an amazing journey. Uh, I didn't know that at the time. It seemed like the right decision, but man, so and that's that's what I learned. But, it, but the funny story is that before I made that decision, there was this little guy, like this strange little guy, and he would like talk to his clients who were, who were financial advisors, and this is like 05, 06, uh, probably 05 actually, closer to 05. And he would get under his desk and he would just whisper to his clients, you see this level? It's support and resistance. And he would, <laughs> he like looking at these charts, but he was very strange. He was like a very strange guy. Uh, and he would, his name was, uh, should I, I don't even know if I should say his name. His name was Jay. Let's just call him Jay. And he would just go under his desk and he would just talk to his clients about these charts. And he'd be like, JC, come here, come here. You see this? This is the level. And then it broke out. And this is a double top. And this. And I'm like looking around. I'm like, this guy's out of his mind. I'm not going under your desk, buddy. Sorry. Yeah, all right. Yeah, I don't know what's going on down there, but I'm following you. So years later, you know, maybe like a year later, I started reading like technical analysis of financial markets by John Murphy, you know, technical analysis of stock trends. And I'm like, oh my God, that's what that strange little man was talking about the whole time. Yeah, got it. So, so it, was like, it was like voodoo to you, some crazy guy. Uh, and then it, it all kind of like makes sense. Cool. Um, so what, do you remember the first stock you ever bought? New York Community Bancorp. Woohoo! Is Ticker it? symbol NYB on the New York Stock Exchange. It was like around 12 bucks at the time. No, that's a lie. It was like 17 bucks at the time. Um, they paid a nice dividend, like three and a half, four percent dividend. Um, and it never did shit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, that, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I'm sure you, you sort of, the, the first thing I ever, I ever bought was, um, I think I saw it across CNBC, like the ticker and I was like, wow, that's a cool sounding ticker. And, um, that's awesome. All right. What was so, the first stock you ever made money on? Was the first stock I ever bought, which is Octel. There you go. There you My go. Six flags. 
Six Flags. So. Triple. It was PKS. So this was before it was SIX. PK. I don't even know if it's still trading. PKS. It went from like three and a half to twelve. Wow. So, I thought I was like I was like this is easy. Easy. So easy. <laughs> Uh, got it. New York Community Bank didn't turn out to be a monster with its 4% yield, but Six Flags was. But Six Flags was. So then after Six Flags, I bought this company, Magna Entertainment, Mecca, M-E-C-A, and I, I think it lost like 80%. <laughs> and, that, I swear, and I swear, and that's when I was like, okay, I need to learn something. That's when it hit me. Because prior to that, I was a genius. And then, right, I'm the next Paul Tudor Jones. I, I mean, I buy one right. stock, it doesn't do anything. I buy another stock, it triples. That's a pretty good track record so far. Right, right. Just, bu just buy the ones that go up. That's a pretty easy strategy. Yeah, duh. duh. <laughs> cool. All right. So that's awesome. So um, tell us about uh, All Star Charts. Um, when, when did you start it? What's the value proposition? Tell me about the company. Yeah, well, like I said, you know, it was just a blog. Um, and what was interesting and, and sort of the, the first time I realized that, you know, investors around the world were interested in seeing my homework is that I was managing a hedge fund, 2012, 2013, I'm managing a hedge fund and I would write monthly letters to my investors. And I had traders at hedge funds that only gave me money to manage for them. It was like a joke. Like I'll throw you a bone as long as I get your letters. Right. It was for them. It was like a joke, hundred grand, quarter million bucks. It was nothing for them. Uh, but they would get my monthly letters. And that's what they were interested in. So I was like, what? So then I'm managing the hedge fund and it was expensive. Imagine, you know, you know, office on Fifth Avenue, uh, you know, the compliance, the attorneys, I mean, forget about it. Um, so a company out of Detroit uh, by the name of Benzinga, I'm sure you're probably familiar with those guys. Jason, yep. They had, a they had like a division at the time, this was in 2013, 2014, that it was a kind of like a back-end provider where if you wanted to sell any like subscription services, they would handle it all. So they were like, you know, busting my chops forever because these guys were drinking buddies of mine every time they were in New York. Hey, JC, let's get a beer, blah, blah, blah. Like we ran in the same circle. So they're always like, when are you going to give us something to sell? Look at this guy. He's selling like uh, marijuana stock picks and he's making like a hundred grand a month, you know, selling these stock picks. And I'm like, oh my God. I was like, all right. So here, I I'm doing all this homework anyway. I'm the only one that sees it. Uh, if nobody buys it, I still have to do the homework. So here you go. See, see if you can make me a few bucks. And th they did. And they did make me quite a few bucks. And it got to the point where, you know, I didn't come from money. My family, uh, you know, I'm the first one born in this country for that matter. Uh, I was the first one to go study away. Uh, so it got to the point where like to ignore uh, the sort of like this research company that was built, like, you know, I don't want to say overnight, but kind of like pretty quickly. Um, in favor of one day maybe becoming the next Carl Icon, which is what was my goal at the time. It's like, oh, I don't need to sell the research. I'll just raise a billion dollars. Right, right. <laughs> you know? And, 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 and the, the research in the newsletter is probably a little less stressful and, and uh, more consistent than... You know, the truth is, Rob, I have absolutely no interest in uh, selling a research newsletter. I mean, it's just not anything I'm interested in. I want to manage a billion dollars, right? And I'll, I'll get to that point. Um, but what ended up happening is sort of like I realized I should pay attention to this. It was just kind of like an unfinished product at the time. I was like, okay, let's get the hell out of New York. I moved out with my, with my girlfriend at the time, now my wife and, and you know, my, my future mother. She's, gonna, she's due in a couple months. So at the time she was just my girlfriend. I was like, let's move to California, a couple of years, turn a product into a business, and then we'll move back to New York, relaunch the fund, and live happily ever after. Like that was like the, the, the thought process. And she, she'll tell you it was a one-year plan. I will tell you it was a two-year plan. It turned into a five-year plan because Sonoma was uh, that awesome. And it wound up being really good for her work as well. She got a couple of promotions. Like it was wound up being great for both of us. Fantastic experience in California. I was able to travel all over the world, Tokyo multiple times, Singapore, Hong Kong a few times, uh, India three times, so I, you know, uh, Taiwan, Philippines. So I've been able to really learn a lot. And sure, I was building my business to what you see today, but along the way, there were a lot of selfish steps that I was learning so much in Kuala Lumpur you know, in Taiwan and Hong Kong. I mean, th these were amazing experiences that will help me for the rest of my life. And then here we are. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're working on, on, on putting the fun together and, and a launch uh, at some point. Uh, we're working with some partners to get that done. It's gotta be the right deal. You know, I'm in a different position now. You know, at the time it was like, I had a hundred thousand of my own money and I'm, 
you know, walking around New York with a tin cup, uh, you know, begging for, for, for pennies, you know, um, and, you know, from now that we're in a much better position uh, fiscally, uh, if you will, at our company, because, you know, I started this company eight years ago. So the fact that, you know, we've come a long way, I don't just have to take any penny. We can be really selfish, uh, partner up with a family office who's serious, um, you know, cut one big check, something like that. So that's what we're waiting on. And in the meantime, you know, we're having a blast. You know, research firm is great. I talk to the biggest institutions in the world every single day. These are the biggest banks, biggest hedge funds. You're all household names. You know them all. Uh, and then a lot that you don't know uh, that also have billions in assets. They're just not household names. And it's really interesting because they all have different, you know, like I'll talk to a family office in San Francisco and they manage money for a Chinese billionaire. Uh, and, you know, they're like, I look at their portfolio and it's basically the NASDAQ one right you know, we focus on tech. It's like, well, just buy the cues and call it a day. Like, why, you know? <laughs> and, you know, so, and then you have investors in Texas and they're more oil oriented. And then you have macro investors. And the one thing we've noted, uh, noticed on the institutional side is that there's no one size fits all. Every institution needs something different. So we provide that for the institutions. And then at All Star Charge on the main blog, uh, we provide a premium service. It's a little under 500 bucks a quarter or about 16, 1700 bucks a year. And you get access to all of it and you get pretty much everything the institutions get, except maybe a couple of reports uh, and, and obviously be the ability to talk to the analysts on the phone and stuff like that. But you're able to get a lot, a lot of trade ideas. Um, you get access to our chart book, monthly conference calls. Uh, so our clients uh, seem to be happy about it. I started, I met you and I started following you in 2018, I believe in the summer. Um, and you were bullish, bullish, bullish. And I was like, all right, this guy is just bullish all the time. And then you had a piece saying, what does a bearish JC look like? Right. And all of a sudden you turn bearish and I'm just like, Who, what the hell is going on? And then the market sells off. And I was just like, wow, this guy is pretty good. <laughs> and then two days after the bottom, you turn back bullish and you're like, I'm bullish again. And you know, I haven't followed you for 10 years or anything. It's only been two years. And you've called every single turn in the market, which is pretty freaking good. Um, uh, you've been bullish at the right time. You turned bearish at the beginning of this year or at the end of last year. I don't remember the exact timing. Um, you turned bullish again near the market bottom. Uh, so, uh, you know, based on my experience with you, I think you're batting 100. Uh, you, you probably, you know, I'm sure throughout the career, not everyone has, has perfect calls and stuff like that. So... Um, whoever's listening to this, uh, definitely follow JC. Um, what's great about you is you put out so much free content, which I think is great in terms of your, your emails. Obviously, you have a paid product that people can subscribe to, but even the free content is so valuable uh, because you give your main ideas there. Um, so definitely definitely uh, suggest that, that people sign up for, is it your newsletter or uh, on Twitter? Where do you, what's the best distribution? I mean, if you go to allstarcharge.com slash join, you know, you could join uh, our premium service and get access to everything. Um, and then just follow me at All Star, um, on Twitter, StockTwits, Instagram, YouTube, at All Star Charts. Uh, it's the same uh, across the board. And I appreciate uh, the kind words, but just real quick on that. The reason I wrote that blog post at the beginning of October of 2018, what does a bearish JC look like? It's because I hadn't had a bearish thesis on equities in years. Like yep. I was labeled a permable, you, yep. you know, you saying, ah, oh, this guy's only, is only always bullish. I was getting that a lot. Um, Which was the right call. <laughs> it was the right call. Fortunately, we were bullish for a long time since yeah. the beginning of 2016. But those of people that have been following me longer than you have remember that in two, in the summer of 2015, I was end of the world bearish. Like the world is ending. Deutsche Bank's going to zero, sell everything. And then at the end of January of 2016, we turned bullish. At the time, I thought it was a dead cat bounce that was ultimately going to roll over in a very similar way that I thought off the March lows, it was going to be a dead cat bounce that has now transitioned into something bigger. So what's really interesting is that while in early 2016, we were buying stocks because it was a dead cat bounce. And or we thought it was going to be a dead cat bounce. And in March of this year, we were buying stocks because we thought it was a dead cat bounce. We were buying stocks for the same reasons. But the information, the data that we were getting in April and May of 2016, and the data that we've been getting in May, basically, of this year, has basically 
opened our eyes that, you know what? This is not a, a bear market rally. This is not a dead cat bounce. Uh, this is not just a trade. This is something bigger. So, you know, we made a bull, we, we've learned these lessons before. Again, 2016 is like the perfect example of that because we look like heroes, but people forget that as bullish as we were, we felt very strongly in early 2016 that it was just a counter trend rally. That, but then it turned into something else. And we've seen the same thing now. So it's just really interesting comparisons. Got it. Awesome. Well, thank you for correcting uh, and, and uh, uh, highlighting that vulnerability. Um, obviously, you, you can't predict the future, but as I followed you, I think you've... Uh, the thing I, I really like about your style is you're really consistent about what you, how you look at things. Um, and I, sometimes I disagree with your view based on my how personally I look at things. Uh, but you just remain very consistent in terms of like, here's why I'm bullish or here's why I'm bearish. And if these things change, I'm changing. Um, and I think that's so important to just have that framework because no one has the correct way of predicting the future because it's impossible. But what I like is that now that I've, I've followed you for a little bit, I sort of understand how you think and why you think and what you're looking at. And that consistency really resonates with me. Um, well, I, I appreciate that, Rob. And, and what we try to do is we try to put together a thesis, right? Whatever that might be, long bulls, short bonds, whatever. What we'll do when we say, okay, we're buying gold, let's just say, or we're buying financials, we'll set a list of things that if they happen, we'll confirm that we're in the right direction. And we'll also make a list of things that if those things happen, it's probably because we're wrong. Because the idea is to know that we're wrong as quickly as possible, right? Yeah, if you're sitting around an investment and you find out two years later that you got it wrong, that sucks. Right? We want to know we're wrong early. The faster we know that we're wrong, we can move on, the better. So we want to lay out what it's going to take to prove us wrong. Yeah. And I think that's what um, a lot of times new investors or novice investors get wrong is that they think that getting things right is the end game. But as you're in this business, you know that actually getting things wrong quickly and realizing they're wrong is the key to winning in this game. Uh, and if you could just correct your mistakes and not have those massive drawdowns, you're way ahead of the game because like we've learned over the past several years and, and today, you can't predict the future. It just, there's too many variables to predict it. So you just got to read the tea leaves. All right. So real quick, before we move into markets, let's say I don't believe in technical analysis. I think it's bullshit. I think I'm a fundamental investor. How do you convince me that technical analysis, like why does technical analysis work? It seems too easy. How can looking at the charts tell me what's going to happen in the future? Well, one, it's not easy. <laughs> um, I mean, you're wearing a t-shirt, you're smiling, it looks easy. Well, I, I, I have a lot of things to smile about. You know, I'm very fortunate that I get to do what I love every single day. I get to start talk to smart people like yourself every day. I mean, you know, it's a dream come true. There's no, there's no hiding that. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm thankful every single day. I'm, I have my health. My family has their health. I mean, I'm incredibly blessed. That's awesome. Totally aware of that. Um, to quote the Brian Shannon, only price pays, right? So the only way to make money in this game is to sell something at a higher price than where we bought it. And not necessarily in that order, right? But that's the goal at the end of the day. So if we're ignoring, and by saying the technical analysis is voodoo or it's nonsense or whatever it is, if by saying that, you're literally ignoring price, right? That's what you're saying. You're ignoring the behavior of the market. And if there's one thing that we know is fact, the only fact of the matter is price, right? That will never be restated. Earnings are going to be restated. GDP numbers, unemployment, those will always be restated. We know for a fact they are. They're just estimates, right? Price is the only thing that's actual fact. If, if, if Microsoft trades at this price, at this time, at this day, there's a buyer and a seller changing hands. That will never, ever, ever change no matter what. That is fact forever. And what else do we know is fact? We know that markets trend. Stock prices trend. They go up for a while. They go down for a while. They go sideways for a while. I don't care if you're a fundamental analyst, an economist, if you're looking at the stars and the moons. It doesn't matter, right? It, 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 prices trend. You show a, a, a chart to a four-year-old little girl, you tell her, sweetie, what, tell me what's it going to She said, daddy is going up, right? Or no, nope, that one's going down. Like any idiot could see that, right? And if you look at as many charts, you don't have to look at as many charts as I do, but go back and look at any chart over any time frame long-term, intraday, 
any chart, any time frame, the market is fractal, what are you going to find? You're going to find trends. You're going to find periods where it goes up for a while, periods where it goes down for a while, and periods where it does nothing for a while. That's just what it is. So what do we do as technical analysts? We are identifying those trends. Hey, this one's going up. Hey, this one's going down. Because if the stock is going up, there's a much higher likelihood, right? Because markets trend, there's a much higher likelihood that it's going to continue in that direction than for it to completely reverse and go in the opposite direction. So we actually do really, really well with the fundamental community because they do all this homework on all these balance sheets and income statements and things that give me a headache just thinking about. And then they take what we do and the price analysis is a supplement to the work that's already being done. So what we do at All Star Charts, we're not trying to replace anything. It's not like this is some holy grail, uh, but being able to analyze price trends and then use that analysis to manage risk, most importantly, is I think where we add the most value. And if you're, if you're ignoring price, how on earth are you going to manage risk? Like, we know we're wrong because prices break a certain level and prove us wrong, right? If you're a fundamental analyst completely ignoring price, where do you know you're wrong? Like when they file for bankruptcy, oh, got that one wrong. Like what's the information that you're going to get that's going to tell you that you're wrong as quickly as possible, which you and I both agreed is incredibly important. You know, as a fundamental analyst, if you're going to choose to ignore price. How do you manage risk responsibly? Yeah, yeah. That's no, that, that's a, that's a great framework of technical analysis. I, you know, um, I, the, the first time I ever, uh, got, uh, familiar with momentum it just after I got my CFA 2004, 2005, I was working at Goldman Sachs research. My project was to figure out which factors drive future price performance, which fundamental factors. And I had margins and ROE and PE, and I put in price momentum just, just cause it was there. It was like in the data set. And I'm running these calculations and I'm like, why is price momentum have the biggest um, predicting factor on the future? And I'm just like, there's something wrong in this data. Like what, the, like PE doesn't have any, any predictive power, margins, uh, ROE, you know, um, C, CEO pay, anything fundamental. And then this academic guy sitting next to me is like, oh, I think you're capturing the price momentum factor. And I'm like, what is the price momentum factor? He's like, well, it's this factor that the price predicts the future. And I'm just like, that doesn't make any sense. Like my CFA tells me that fundamental analysis is all that. So that was the first time I was like scratching my head. I was like, this is really weird. Like, but that's the, that's the, the, uh, the evidence-based um, reason argument for why technical analysis works is because momentum is a predictive factor of future price returns. Um, no, and it's been proven mathematically, MIT, I mean, you know, even the academics proven. have come on board. Yeah, absolutely. It's been proven time and time again. All right, cool. Last question before we get into markets. What do you think, to, uh, so people listening here, maybe they're starting to look at technical analysis they're interested in. What do you think people that start out get wrong or what should they look out for when they're starting to think about technical analysis? You know, I think it probably goes to any investor. Um, you know, instead of worrying so much about how much money you're going to make and what you're going to do with that money and all those things, I think to focus more on keeping the money you have. Um, and I think technical analysis is the best tool in the world to allow you to do that. I know that's not sexy, right? What's sexy? Oh, Lamborghini. Oh, penny stocks. Oh, you know, financial freedom, like all that crap that you hear on the internet, like that's garbage, that's bullshit, right? What actually, in the real world, uh, it's the risk management and go read Market Wizards. And when you're done reading Market Wizards, read it again. What are you gonna find? These are the best traders of all time. And what do you hear in every single interview with all of those traders? They all have different strategies, but the one common denominator is risk management. That's what makes them great, not the Lamborghinis and penny stocks and financial freedom and all that garbage. It's the risk management. It's not sexy, but that's just what it is. Yeah, yeah, got it. Cool, awesome. Let's uh, turn this around into some uh, market ideas, into some investment ideas. So I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to pull up a. Um, I'm going to pull up a version of. Coifin, and we could go through some charts here because at the end of the day, um, uh, we want to highlight some features and some things that you could do on Coifin that maybe other people don't know about. So 
you know, um, the way we can do this is, is you tell me what to pull up or you, t you sort of talk about like, what is your thesis right now? Um, and I'll be able to, I'll be able to pull it up and we could discuss some trends right here. Let me just turn over the, well, cool. All right. So what's the first thing I should look at in terms of like your thesis? What are you looking at? So this is something that I learned uh, from Jeff DeGraff. I always try to give credit. I try to do a good job of giving credit to those that I learn certain things from. Sometimes I remember, sometimes I don't. But in this case, I know for a fact that Jeff DeGraff, uh, one of the best technicians in the world, no doubt about it, just had him on the podcast recently. He said, the first thing we want to do is identify what type of market environment we're in. Okay. Then we can figure out what tools to use to take advantage of that particular market. Like Bruni always says, you don't want to brush your teeth with a hammer, right? You want to be able to, you want to use a toothbrush for that. And yep. when it's time to hang a mirror on the wall, you're not going to reach for the toothpaste. You're going to get a hammer and a nail, right? We have different tools for different uh, necessities, different environments. Same thing in the market, right? You don't want to use trend following systems in a range bound market. You know, you don't want to use, you know, range bound, you know, selling, you know, selling ranges and buying lows and selling highs in a trending market. You're going to get run over. So at first identify the market we're in. And I think that what's interesting here in the current environment is that consolidations are resolving higher. They're not resolving lower. So in a lot of cases, we see like a symmetrical triangle in a stock and people are like, JC, how did you know that that was going to resolve higher? And it's like, well, I didn't know, but all the other stocks in that sector had similar ranges and they were resolving higher. So the higher probability outcome was at that one. It's not that I'm a genius, it's that all the other ones are doing the same thing. So that is what we call a trend. So, What's happening now? So, so Consolidations so talk, are resolving higher. So t talk to me, how do I know what market environment is? What are you looking at? Look at, look at the, the, the stuff that has gotten beat up the, the most this year. Look at Latin America, ILF. Price only, preferably. Yep. So we're not going to get into this, but I'm going to look at price only, which means I'm not looking at the adjusted price, which means I'm not looking at the, uh, at the dividends. Okay. Full disclosure for those, uh, dividends. this is a separate podcast where we, where we debate whether to include dividends or not in the price, but, uh, let's, uh, let, and then let's... we take a tequila shot every time we say the word dividend, right? <laughs> All right. So look, put the line from the low in 2016. And draw that horizontal line across. You know, we, we like to use ranges. You know, support and resistance is more of a range. It's more of a zone. We don't like to draw our trend lines with pencils. We like to draw them with crayons. You know, we want to think of support and resistance kind of like a mattress. You know, imagine like a little kid at like a hotel, you know, uh, jumping up and down on the mattress. It's got some give. That's how we look at support and resistance. And but what I want to point you to, and you can zoom in up to the uh, zoom in on the on the daily, just so that you see the 2016 lows, and then what we have today. Notice how we are back above those 2016 lows. Okay, and look at that consolidation. That consolidation we've seen over the last couple of months, right? That's a, a classic triangle, symmetrical triangle. You know, it's got every name in the book. But that's a consolidation that should resolve in the direction of the underlying trend. And I don't know if you got the memo, but the trend in Latin America has been very much down, right? So the fact that it did not resolve in the direction of the underlying trend is the signal in itself. So it's not that technical analysis doesn't work. It's that maybe your technical analysis didn't work because now you're fighting it because you think it should have broken down. No, the fact that it broke out and didn't break down, that's the signal. So I think that's incredibly bullish. Take a look at... Um, so, so, so sorry, JC, can I just chime in here? Yeah. I think what you said there is one mistake that I notice new technical people say is, well, actually two mistakes. One is they think that like 1823 is the price and that's like the exact price that you should look because I drew this line and the way I use it, I don't know if you do, is this is like a general area for you. Like this, yeah. this line could be like a little bit thicker. It doesn't need to be this penny line it could be sort of an area that we're looking at to sort of say, hey, this is the thing. And then the other thing is, it's okay to say, hey, typically these, these patterns resolve to the downside because this is a consolidation. Consolidation means that it's a continuation pattern typically, but you're open-minded to what the market does. So you're sort of saying, hey, I have a view, but the fact that it did this and broke out of this consolidation here, that's a, a new data point. And it's unlikely that this happens and all of a sudden we make new lows. It could happen, 
but it's unlikely that all of a sudden the market's going to break out this consolidation and then make new lows. Agreed. Now take a look at now take a look at TLT in August of 2016. Price only, please. Price so everything price only. And then look at compared to compared to the. Um, so sorry, where am I drawing the line? Um, well, if you would. Okay, so focus on, go look on a daily chart. Focus on the 2016 consolidation. And then you can see how it, it consolidated above those 2015 highs. See that? So if you want to zoom into the 2015, 2016 period. So this is 2015. This yeah. is, this is, so, so here it's kind so of. Look at that breakout above the 2015 highs. That yep. consolidated like a symmetrical triangle. You see that? Yep. So, so kind of, kind of here. My, um. No, 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 no. Above the 2015 highs. So above the 20. Oh, I see what you're saying. The early 2015 highs. Oh, uh, got it. So uh, let me just move this here. So, so horizontal kind of, line from 2015 highs through 2016. No, no, no. 2015 highs. Early 2015 so, highs. So you have control of my mouse. Tell me, point to where you want to point. Right here. Okay. Okay. Got it. So you're talking about this this triangle right right over there. Okay. Exactly. Go ahead. Tell me what you're thinking. So we have this triangle right here across, right? So this is a breaking out above the 2015 highs in a triangle yep. that should resolve in the direction of the underlying trend. However, it did not. That was the signal. And what happened to bonds? They got destroyed. So I think we're in a similar situation. I'll pull up EWZ today. So hold on. So that signal basically told you, hey, bonds broke out. It was a false breakout in, in technical parlance. They broke down past it. Over here, you would have gotten your signal, hey, bonds are now going the other way. It was a false breakout. Here, you would get, you would get bullish on equities. Uh, as soon as we got back below the 2015 highs, it was over. So, so like kind of like right around? Yep. As soon as we broke and even retested it and everything. Got it. Okay, got it. So are you, and, and then if we look at here, are you looking at something similar here? What's going on here today? No, look at EWZ. And we can get into what we're seeing in bonds now in a minute, if you'd like. Look at EWZ. I think it's just a great uh, example of what we're seeing in Latin America, that consolidation resolving higher. You know so, this is the, so this is Brazil, yep. uh, long-term history. So um, this is the consolidation we talked about in ILF, where this is uh, causing a triangle and then breaking out higher. Yep. Got it. Okay. Um, and now look at TNX, 10-year yields. Oh, so for us, it's US 10-year. Okay. Look at that consolidation. Where is it resolving? Looks like it's resolving higher. And should that be surprising considering all the other consolidations around the world that look like that are also resolving higher? So, so it's all consistent. It's sort of all pointing in the same direction. So yields going up means it's more risk on, more reflation. Um, all the emerging markets, all the growthy names, uh, stocks are, are going up, which means yep. risk on. What's, what's like, if I were a bear and I was looking for like bearish data points, what's the most bearish data point that you could tell me? The most bear, for equities. For equities or risk. The most bearish data point for equities or risk. Um, that's a great question. Um, you know, honestly, I'm not like, I'm not like Vix guy or anything like that. Uh, maybe the volatility index being down to 25, maybe considering it was a freaking 80, like that might be something like if you got to hang your hat on anything, but I, if you're hanging your hat on what the Vix is doing, just retire. Right. Right. And, and even some of the, so some of the sectors where you guys were sort of saying, we're not sure if it's a dead cap bounce. So like KRE was one sector that you were yep. pointing to. Where, um, how's that? How's that consolidation resolving? Right, right. we're back so, above all those former lows. Right. So, you, so you were looking at kind of like this. Um, you were looking at this sort of level, or maybe yep. around here, uh, and exactly. then it, it it broke that level, and then it it couldn't break down even more. It sort of came came right back up. Yep. So now, um, now we expect this to to sort of hold. And we wouldn't expect this to make a new low anytime soon. And then the risk off stuff, like we're, we're, when, when, when the market's under stress, where do they go? They go to yen, they go to bonds, uh, they go you know, U.S. Treasury bonds, they go to gold, and bonds and yen are breaking down. And 
And now look at, and if you want punch up gold and, and look at that consolidation, and if all the risk on, if you will, assets are resolving higher, how do you think this consolidation in gold is going to resolve? So you think gold actually breaks down here? It can, you know, we're seeing bonds and yen breaking down and we're seeing consolidations in stocks breaking out. So, you know, have I thought that gold has been in a bull market? Have we been buying gold and gold stocks? Hell yeah, they've been doing great. You know what I mean? Like, are you kidding me? This is one of the best gold calls we ever made. Um, but if we start to break uh, back below uh, certain levels, you know, I think uh, it could be a big problem here. I can actually punch it up. Um, so if we start breaking below 1680. So here, I'll do GC1. Is that what you want me to do? Yeah. Okay. You know, we start breaking below 1680. That consolidation is resolving lower, not higher, which I think if interest rate consolidations are resolving higher, bond consolidations are resolving lower, yen resolving lower, stock consolidations, especially in the worst areas like freaking Latin America, are resolving higher then what's the bet we want to make on how this consolidation in gold results? And I, as you mentioned before, we can't predict the future, but if we're below 1680, it's not good for gold. Right, right. So, so here it's consolidating again for, from, from an uptrend, from a very clear uptrend. Above former resistance. Above, above former resistance. And basically around here, or you said even higher, this is your sort of line in the sand, which was before this was resistance, now it's support. Theoretically. Got it. Okay. Um, that's, that's, that's awesome to know. Um, what, what do you think has the um, kind of like, uh, one thing I wanted to ask you, you have a, you had sort of an interesting take on sector performance. So in the kind of like March, April period, what you were highlighting is that tech was obviously leading the way, right? So even though the market was sort of unsure what to do, tech was leading the way. And you highlighted that as if you're going to buy something by tech, if you're going to buy something by, um, by biotech, which was leading the way. And now you've sort of um, had some commentary on, hey, there may be sector rotation. You may want to think about that rotation from leaders to laggards. How do you think about that? And how should investors think about that right now? You know, for me, it's a, it, it's a weight of the evidence thing. And the reason we were so bearish in uh, early February and saying get the hell out of stocks had a lot to do with that sector rotation. I mean, financials, uh, regional banks specifically, were making new all-time relative lows in early February. All-time lows, well before any market crash. So that's the sort of uh, you know, weakness in, in small caps, micro caps, mid caps, weakness in financials, weakness in industrials, technology hitting our upside objectives. So there were a lot of reasons why we were selling stocks. Anyway, fast forward to March, we created a coronavirus index that we were looking at stocks like Zoom and DocuSign, and we were looking at stocks that were showing all sorts of crazy relative strength, super high momentum, even in the depths. I think we put out our coronavirus index, I think on March like the 11th, March 12th, which was the day the market bottomed. The market bottomed on March the 12th. March 23rd gets the credit, because I think that was a low for the S&P and the Dow, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but the list of new 52-week lows and the majority of stocks and sectors, for that matter, bottomed on the 12th. Uh, so we anchor a lot of stuff to that particular date, and we don't necessarily whore ourselves out to the large cap indexes. We like to look at the market uh, from, a, from a broader perspective, particularly because we take that as information. So the best stocks off the lows were communications, which is basically Facebook and Google is half of it, uh, technology, um, and even some consumer discretionary, you can argue. What well, were the laggards? Financials, small caps, transportation stocks, they look terrible, airlines. So we were saying, hey, it's going to take rotation into those areas if this is not just a dead cat bounce and it's going to turn into something more like what we saw in 2016. And what have we seen? Rotation into emerging markets, Latin America, transportation stocks, airlines, financials, interest rates are breaking out. That's, what, that's sector rotation. And to quote uh, Rafa Compora, sector rotation is the lifeblood of a bull market. Without it, we won't see one, and we're getting it. This is what sector rotation looks like. So, so you would be focusing on the previous laggards that are now starting an uptrend? Not so much previous laggards, but sort of reiterating that we want to be betting that consolidations are going to resolve higher, not lower. Got it. So it's less like go buy the biggest piece of crap you could find and more of we're getting confirmation from other areas suggesting 
that we don't have to be as choosy, as picky, because we were being like so picky with stocks that we were buying because everything was crashing. So we were only buying the best of the best. We could look broader and, and not necessarily have to be doing that. Got it. Okay. I got I to gotta ask you about Tesla. So Tesla, very controversial name. Um, there's a lot of, I'm going to take this off. There's a lot of, uh, obviously debate in the investor community about Tesla. Uh, what I love about your style is you don't give a crap about the debate. You don't care if Elon Musk is a fraud or not. All you care about is kind of the market and what it's telling you. So tell me what you're seeing in Tesla right now. Well, our upside objectives are getting hit. You know, uh, we, we had a good, a good buy on that when it was back down to former, uh, you know, former resistance, you know, which from 2000 and uh, what, 2017 through 2000, through the end of 2018, you know, we went back down and retested that. So yeah, uh, why not give it a shot from the long side? And now we're back up to former high. So mission accomplished, great trade. Uh, now we sit back and chill out and let's see what happens. Is it going to break out? Uh, are we going to consolidate? Are we going to sell off? You know, I don't really know the answer, but like, as we mentioned before, that's really what we're looking for. We're looking for that information. Now let's see. Uh, let's, and, yeah. and the crazy part is once you like open your eyes to technical analysis and one of the basic things is previous resistance becomes support, you start seeing these things all the time. Yeah, of course. And, like, and the fact that Tesla went down here, stopped here and started going back up, <laughs> if this is a coincidence, then this coincidence happens all the time. These idiots, these idiots will actually tell you it's a coincidence. The academics will tell their poor students whose parents are paying 60 grand a year that this is a coincidence. Right, right. And, and the more you start opening your eyes to these coincidences, the more you start questioning whether, whether it's more of a, a pattern in the system rather than, than a coincidence. Yeah, the professor's tenure uh, is probably not good for your education. So, so like if I pull up like analyst price target on here, um, or the difference, sorry, this is uh, analyst price target. Analyst, uh, let's see here, boom, put it on there. Let me delete this, let me merge this, let me put this in. So you can see how the analysts have been so wrong on this thing, both up and down, and the price is really just doing what the hell it wants. There's no fundamental, uh, like the, the market is the market, doesn't really care what the analysts think about the stock. Well, the, the, the three sell side analysts that are left, uh, when, they, when they come up with their uh, price targets, they're really just following price. You know, the, the, the best thing to change sentiment is price. Right. Uh, so the, the, the four sell side analysts that are still employed at the, whatever banks still do that sort of thing uh, are just chasing price. So right. what, why does their opinion matter? And, and uh, there's, there's actually uh, more than two. So it looks like about 35, but yeah. The best is when a stock is making new 52 week highs and like less than 10% of the analysts have a buy recommendation on it. That's great. Oh, right. oh my God. These guys are getting abused on their like monthly conference calls or whatever. It's hilarious. So that's because that's sort of like, that, it's not fundamental analysis, but it's positioning. And so it's using positioning against you. Like, like here, um, if you were looking, if you were following the stock, the stock starts breaking out of, of a consolidation and short interest is pretty well, is pretty elevated. So that can tell you that, Hey, positioning is still off sides. And that's a lot of, um, that's still, there's still a lot of buying power left in the stock. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll never forget it. Cause I didn't really realize that fundamental analysts thought that short interest and positioning was technical analysis, but obvious, of course it's technical analysis. Are we analyzing the goods and the services that a particular market deals with? Or are we analyzing the behavior of the market and its participants? And obviously, by looking at short interest and sell side ratings and all of that stuff, we're analyzing the behavior of the market and market participants. And I was on, uh, I used to host CNBC Fast Money, like way back in the day, uh, like 2013 or something like that. I remember we were in commercial and Karen Feinerman was like, JC, you look at short interest? I thought you were a technical analyst. And I'm like, yeah, of course we look at short interest because that's technical analysis. And that was the first time I realized that like, Fundamental analysts think that's theirs. Nope, that's ours too. So, you know, what I would encourage you to do is analyze the positioning because if you, you, you talk about short interest, if you have crazy high short interest, those are natural buyers. People are like, oh, ban short sellers. Oh, short selling is bad. That's, they, they have to buy the stock back. Like literally the only way they can unwind their position is to buy it back. Like short sellers are not a bad thing. Right, and, and that's a, that's a, 
um, that's a good argument on the bullish side right now is all the cash on the sidelines that still needs to get into this market um, and, and uh, kind of the, the next phase or an additional phase of the buying power to come. Um, cool. That's awesome. Um, so before we wrap up, uh, I'm going to ask you favorite movie. Everyone's stuck at home or I guess people are going out now. Favorite movie uh, over the past year that uh, you would recommend people watch? Whoa, favorite movie over the last year. You know, my wife and I, we have a hard time finding a movie that we'll both enjoy. Um, I encourage you to watch the Michael Jordan documentary. Uh, if you've been uh, living under a rock uh, the past couple of months and didn't know that it's been out because it is awesome. That 92 uh, dream team was like the greatest thing that could have ever happened to me at 10 years old. It was like the best summer of my life. Yeah. Watching all my favorite players abuse all these international teams. <laughs> oh, my God. Jordan and Magic and Barkley. I mean, I love all those guys. I was 10 years old. They were all my heroes on the same team. It was ridiculous. My, my, uh, so that was like the best time of my life. So I really enjoyed the, the Jordan documentary. Um, and there was a new documentary uh, called Delicacy that is about a sea urchin. Got it. Okay. So on Michael Jordan, I love the documentary, but I also love people on Twitter saying, wow, Michael Jordan reminds me of me. Um, and that's why people think I'm an asshole. <laughs> and that's my favorite thing too, uh, after the, um, so, uh, so delicacy, um, I don't know if people know, but you're a sommelier, uh, officially licensed and trained. Um, you also, is there like a sake sommelier designation? What is that called? There is a sake sommelier designation. That's what it's called. I am not one. I'm actually oh, not a, one. I'm a certified sake advisor. So I'm sake. one step away from a sake sommelier, which maybe one day I may or may not do. I'm focused. As soon as I finish writing my book, that's that's my I can't I can't study for any wine exams until I finish my book. That's a, a personal goal. Um, but when I'm done with the book, I'm going to study for my Italian wine scholar because I was a fr I, I, I'm a French wine scholar as well, and that process was so cool, so fun. Uh, and I love Italian wine, so that that's next for me, maybe later this year. Cool. Um, one affordable wine that people should try, call it under fifty bucks. Uh, name, region, and also where where can they get it? So you know, I was actually telling my wife this last night. She had no interest in what I had to say, but she pretended to listen and care. So I was explaining to her because I was drinking uh, Brunello di Montalcino, which is a Sangiovese, and it's the most aged wine in Italy. It's barrel aged for five years. So um, uh, Brunello di Montalcino. And then there is Vino Nobile de Montepulciano, which is also 100%, both of them are 100% Sangiovese, right? So there's Vino Nobile di Montepulciano and there's Brunello di Montalcino. Now, those are higher end Italian wines. These are some of the best wines on earth, obviously in Italy, but some of the best wines on earth for sure, 100% Sangiovese. Both of those make a version called Rosso. So you have Rosso de Montalcino and Rosso de Montepulciano, which is going to be aged a little bit less, but you're paying like 20%, 25% of the cost of the Brunello de Montalcino or the Vino Nobi de Montepulciano. So if you buy the Rosso de Montepulciano or the Rosso de, de Montalcino, uh, you're going to pay a fraction of the cost and it's going to be juice. That's awesome. Um, I, I can understand why your, wi why your wife won't listen to you because you're drinking wine and she's pregnant and she's like, <laughs> shut the fuck up about your wines. Uh, I can't yeah. have any. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, in her defense, I understand. Um, all right. Awesome. And, and uh, I understand because my wife is actually pregnant as well. So uh, congrats, Rob. Congrats. Thank you. So, uh, so she, she, I also drink wine in front of her and she gets very mad at me. Actually, she doesn't get mad, but uh, she should. Uh, awesome. JC, thank you so much for being on. Uh, real pleasure conversation. Uh, people can find you on Twitter, All Star Charts. Go to JC's uh, website, All Star Charts uh, slash join. Follow his newsletter. Follow technical analysis. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rob. Bye-bye.